Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Welcome to the second session of the Sahih al-Bukhari seminar. And today I want to begin by looking at the biography of Muhammad Bukhari. We really didn't do much biography except for giving a background of the environment that produced the genius that was Imam al-Bukhari. Um, today, we want to speak about the lineage of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala. Let me forward the slide. Okay, so Bismillah. Um, the name of Imam al Bukhari was Abu Abdullah uh, Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al Mughira ibn Bardizba al Jurfi. And there are a number of titles that are used Amirul Mu'minin fil Hadith, Al Hujja, Al Hafidh, Imam, Al Hafidh al Islam, and so on and so forth. His kunya was Abu Abdullah. His name was Muhammad, and his father's name was Ismail. His grandfather's name was Ibrahim. His great grandfather was, um, well, his grandfather's name was Ismail. His great grandfather was Ibrahim. And above him was Al Mughira. Uh, Ibrahim was, uh, let me do this again Muhammad, Ibn Ismail, Ibn Ibrahim, Ibn Al Mughira, Ibn Bardizba. So Bardizba is a strange name. You can tell that something's going on there. And that was his ancestry. So he was actually Zoroastrian. So in the lineage of Imam Bukhari, there's someone who was a Muslim. So at some point, everyone converts to Islam, embraces Islam. So Bardizba, um, I just turned that fan off because it's static. This is working, right? Yeah, it's creating interference with the but if you put it on low, maybe it'll work. And not circulate it or point it in one direction, that should be fine. So Bardizba in, in Farsi, so his origin was Persian, right? Um, he was Zoroastrian, and it, it means farmer. So the word means farmer in one of the languages of um, one of the Persian family languages. And so Bardizba, the farmer, his son was Al Mughira. Al Mughira is a clearly Muslim name. Right? So Al Mughira, the great grandfather of Imam uh, Bukhari, was the one who embraced Islam. <clears throat> he embraced Islam at the hands of Yaman Al Jorfi, who was the governor of Bukhara. And so the governor of Bukhara at that time, this is three generations prior to Imam Bukhari, was Yaman Al Jorfi. And because of that title, Al Jorfi, now this family became known as Al Jorfi. So Imam Bukhari, when you read his name at the end, it says Al Jorfi, Al Bukhari, and in various appellations. So that tells you Al Jorfi wasn't his tribe, but it was because he embraced Islam at his hands, his uh, ancestor. Then they earned that title. It's kind of like a, it's called Wala. It's a concept in Islamic civilization. It doesn't apply that much anymore. So where you know. Um, it applies to this, this situations of slavery where a freed slave would become attached to the previous owner and um, would bear the title or the family name of the owner, but it's by wilaya, not by like uh, being part of that family. Um, online students, you can mute yourselves. Okay. So we don't. We know very little about Ibrahim. Um, who was the grandfather, uh, but we know something about his father, Ismail. So Ismail, the father of Imam al-Bukhari, 
Um, he has a biographical entry in Ibn Hibban's Kitab al Siqa. So his father was a Hadith scholar as well. He used to travel for Hadith. Um, he didn't write a lot of books. He wasn't that famous, but at least he was known in the circles of knowledge. And um, his name does appear in biographical works. His father was someone who traveled for Hadith. He narrated from great individuals like Imam Malik. His father was a student of Imam Malik. Um, you later from Hamad ibn Zayd and others. So his father was known about his father is that he was very careful about his wealth. Um, he never let any um, any doubts creep into his earnings, his income, was purely halal. He was very careful about that. And although we know very little about his life, but sometimes you do certain things in your life, you live a certain way that gets remembered. And now until the end of time, where every time we read about Imam al-Bukhari, always mentions that his father was careful about his wealth and that he left behind inheritance. There was a single um, dinar in there that was from tainted sources. So, and that probably is one of the secrets behind the stature of Imam al-Bukhari, because these things really matter. Um, his father died when he was very young, so he never really met him, he never really studied with him. Um, so he was orphaned at a young age and raised by his mother. So his mother raised him. She was very pious. She was known for worship. She used to make so much dua. Um, we know very little about his early life, except that, you know, he was born normally and then he became blind in childhood. And when he became blind in his childhood, his mother used to make dua immensely for him. And then she saw once in a dream that Ibrahim, who was his grandfather came to her and announced that her son would see again. And when she woke up, he slowly began to get his vision back and then he lived a normal life. So that's one of the examples of where the dua of the mother is, is incredible. It's something that really benefited Imam al-Bukhari. So when you read biographies, you need to think um, when you see great individuals, you look at the ingredients um, of these individuals. What, what was it about them? And it's always more than one factor, but um, part of it is their environment, part of their upbringing, and a big part of that uh, inevitably has to do with their parents. Um, so his father died when he was young, and then he performed Hajj with his older brother and his mother. So his mother, his older brother, and Bukhari went to Hajj at a young age, and Bukhari stayed in Mecca to seek knowledge while his mother and brother came back. And his brother eventually died and then Bukhari came back and reunited with his mother. So that's what we know about his lineage. Um, and I just wanted to mention that briefly. I don't want to do the biography yet. We'll do bits and pieces every day, inshallah, so that we cover the book, we cover the biography, and we cover um, you know, the hadith that we're reading it's, uh, as well, inshallah. So that's his lineage. Okay, so now we want to talk about any any questions so far. So if you have questions in my seminars, I want you to interrupt me. Um, in every section, um, you can ask the questions. Um, I get tired of asking again. Are there any questions? So just this is this is an interactive seminar. It should be an interactive seminar. Um, we're trying to learn together. We're going to be reading from the books together. So um, my voice also needs a break. So anytime you have questions, um, you're reading from the book, uh, pronunciation, anything, don't hesitate. Online students likewise. Now, this, the issue we want to finish our discussion from yesterday is the issue of the muhtasa. Remember the title? Okay, let me do the slide. Remember the title of Imam Bukhari's collection of hadith. al jamir al jamir Al-Musnad, Al-Sahih, Al-Mukhtasar, Min Umuri Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Sunanihi Wa Ayyamihi. We spent a fair amount of time speaking about the title, but we left the discussion open, and that is this idea of Mukhtasar. And that's very important, because to understand Bukhari, this is extremely important to decipher what it means or what Imam Bukhari meant uh, by this word muhtasa. So normally we know um, for us when we say muhtasa, 
as the brother mentioned yesterday, um, it means condensed, something that is condensed, something that is summarized, something that is selected. So it's kind of like a selection. So the issue here is, so we do know that this book, Sahih al-Bukhari, al Jamir al-Sahih, was taken from a broader array of hadith. So there was a selection that took place, an extraction, a selection. So what was the nature of that selection? Because understanding that makes all the difference um, into how we approach hadith, and it has huge implications on many things. So to begin with, here's a statement of Imam al-Bukhari himself. So he was so famous, he wrote so many works, so many students came to him that um, there is so much biographical, autobiographical material that comes from him, like where he studied. And so he said, Lam akhruj fi al kitabi illa sahihan. I did not relate anything in this book except that which was sahih. Wa ma taraktu min al sahih akthar. And I also left out many sahih reports. So is that the one I have? Yes, that's the one I have. In another work, he says the following: Ma adkhaltu fi kitabi al jamir illa ma sah. So I did not enter into my book except that which was Sahih. And I left some of the Sahih so that it would not become lengthy. So, so we know he named the book Muhtasar. We know he did some type of selection. And even from his statement, still it doesn't um, teach us what was the nature of his selection. So it appears if you don't understand who he was, you don't understand the work that he um, uh, engaged in, you don't understand his vision, then a common uh, understanding can arise, well, this is just a selection. So like today, you know, I was uh, one of our um, in the UK is doing a series of classes by a great Yemeni scholar, Sheikh Haider al Waili. So they have a curriculum. They said, we're going to be studying Sahih al-Bukhari on this day, Sunan Tirmidhi on this day. And we encourage students to memorize Mukhtasar Sahih al-Bukhari. So there's a Mukhtasar of Sahih al-Bukhari. There's not one, but there's many. What does that mean? It means Sahih al-Bukhari is so big, to make it easy for students, you just take selections. And you make something smaller that people can memorize. So. But the problem there is when you make selections, what do you leave out and what do you include? So if you're not careful, there are so many things that you'll miss out on. And, you know, when you say Muhtasar Sahih al-Bukhari, it is not Sahih al-Bukhari. So that's something important to know as students that often for the sake of a modern audience, books are summarized. There is a Muhtasar ibn Kathir, Muhtasar every book that you can find. But you have to realize when you study those books, you're not studying the original books of Ibn Kathir or Imam al -Nawi. You're taking a Muhtasar, which is some individuals attempt to take them some things, leave some things out and bring you some things. And he may not have done a good job. And often it's the case that you don't do a good job. And I mentioned, if you realize Sahih al-Bukhari is a book of gems and treasures, there's nothing in there that is extra. So the idea of making a muhtasar of Sahih al-Bukhari doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, but anyway, our discussion is what did Bukhari himself do? What is the nature of his ikhtisar, his muhtasar? So here's a number of, so this, this has been hugely misunderstood. So this common misconception is that Bukhari just did a selection. And people repeat that today. Even many scholars believe it's just a muhtasar many great scholars. So that means it's just a random selection. If that is the case, that has huge implications on the way we study the book. Because if it's just a selection, then someone could come and say, well, this hadith is authentic on the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim, as many have done, erroneously. And they say, well, Sahih ala sharp al-Bukhari. Because they believe, well, Bukhari just summarized. There are many hadith out there that fit his conditions that could be there. And then they bring all sorts of hadith. One of those hadith is, believe it or not, from hadith 102. What was the hadith? That incredible hadith that has to do with, not in the al-a'mal bin niyat, that's 
authentic. But there is a hadith that I began hadith 102 with. It has to do with the founding fathers of America. It's an incredible story. Um, yes, the hadith that the world is created on an ox, it's resting on the horns of an ox, the ox is standing on the back of a whale, and every time the, he has to scratch his neck, he moves, there's an earthquake because the, horn, the ox is moving his horns. That's a hadith that the Hakim says is sahih on the conditions of Bukhari. And that's a hadith Thomas Jefferson's friend, John Leland, wrote about. He said there's some crazy things in this Al-Quran, like this hadith. So he was, first of all, he was mistaken. He felt, he thought it was in the Quran, and it's not in the Quran, but, and he thought that's part of Islam, and that kind of colored their thinking of Islam, because Islam teaches something crazy like that. The earth is on an ox, the ox is on a, you know, whale, the whale is in the ocean, and the ocean is on a rock or something like that, and the rock is on God knows what. That's what he wrote, John Leland. So these founding fathers, they had an understanding of Islam, but so they were quoting these hadith. And unfortunately, this hadith is in Al-Hakim, Mustadrak Al-Hakim. And he says it's sound on the conditions of Bukhari. Could a hadith like that be sound on the conditions of Bukhari, even from the content? But if you look at it, it is not. But if you think Bukhari just made a random selection, then you will not understand what he did. And then you will have all sorts of misconceptions that arise because of that. Um, here's a number of reasons why it can never be a random selection. So first of all, number one, the vision of Bukhari, his great scholarship, and his history of what he did. So just a little biographical, maybe we can get into a biographical tangent. Um, Amr bin Ali al-Fallas, the great Muhadith, said, Hadithun la ya'rifuhu Muhammad ibn Ismail laysa bi hadithun. That's a statement that a hadith that Muhammad bin Ismail didn't know about is not a hadith at all. What does that tell you? It tells you someone like Al-Bukhari and all these other experts, they knew all the hadith. So the hadith is not like, you know, we have, sometimes we have a misconception, there's millions of hadith and they're just trying to get as many as they can. You know, they might've missed out on some. That's not the case at all. Because Imam Bukhari said, when I was 16, before I left my village, to go study, I had memorized all the books of Waqir ibn al-Jarrah, Muhammad ibn al-Mubarak, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, and others. So you already memorized these hadith. They were well known, the hadith of Zuhri were well known, the hadith of Malik were well known. You just traveled in order to, just to research chains and isnas and gain the isnad of the hadith. So it's not the case that you're just traveling to learn new hadith. That's not how it is. That's how it's presented often in many Islamic books, and that's a misconception. Because the sound hadith, the total number of sound hadith, or what's the ballpark number um, from hadith 102, anyone remember? Is it a million, 100,000, 5,000, 10, 20? What's the range we're looking at? Yeah, closer to 10,000. So, and that's with the isnad. So sometimes when you have a different isnad of the same hadith, it counts as a different hadith. So it's not that many out there. So if you know Imam al-Bukhari's work and how he was interacting with the teachers, so he learned the muwatta from many individuals, but one of the individuals he learned the muwatta from, because Imam Malik had died, so Bukhari never met Malik, but he got the muwatta from the students of Malik. So one of them was Ismail ibn Abi Uwais. So he was a son-in-law of Malik. He had married the daughter of Imam Ali, and he's his nephew as well. So he's family, and he also son-in-law. So he's one of the narrators of the Muatta, and he's a good teacher in Medina. But his books were not that good. His memory was not that good. So he's not one of the stronger narrators. But Imam Bukhari took from him, and he actually, when he interacted with the teachers, often the teachers were learning from Bukhari. So. You know, what he used to do, Ismail ibn Abi Uwais, he was ask Bukhari here, take my books, mark the hadith that are a mistake, so I can fix them. So even though that's his teacher, Bukhari was fixing the books of his teachers. And there are many, many famous incidents like that of, with other teachers as well. Suleiman ibn Harb, a great scholar, expert of hadith, he said, Ada yakunu lahu seeds, which means he looked at him when he was only in his teens. 
study him. And he said, this, this boy is going to be famous. He could already tell that something special about him. Um, Bukhari himself admits, he says, when I attended the classes of Suleyman ibn Harb, he said, he used to tell me, Dakhaltu ala Suleyman ibn Harb wa yaqulu li, bayin lana ghalt shu'ba. He used to ask us, teach us about the mistakes of my teacher Shu'ba. So Bukhari was going around teaching his teachers. Um, Abdullah ibn Yusuf at Tinisi, one of the best narrators of the Muwatta Imam Malik, used to say the same thing. He used to ask Bukhari, look into my go- books and tell me of all the mistakes. So, so when you look at when you look at the life and the history of Bukhari, um, of his work. Does it make sense that someone like that would just make a random selection? Like, why would he leave some out? There must be a reason to what he did. And then when you look at number two, second reason why it doesn't make sense that it was a random selection is the vision behind the Sahih. So we haven't talked about that. So that's another topic. Why did Bukhari come up with this? And how did he come up with this idea of compiling the Sahih? So anyone know? Like, there's famous, there's a number of incidents that... Um, that he used to talk about what was the inspiration behind the Sahih? Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, good. So, so it's it's more than one reason, but one of the powerful reasons is Haq ibn Rahaway, one of the great experts of Hadith from the generation of Imam Ahmad. It's Haq ibn Rahaway. When Bukhari was sitting in his classes, so he says, Bukhari says, Kunna inda Ishaq ibn Rahawai, Bakara lo jama'atum kitaban muhtasaran li sahih, sunnati rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he would say, if only one of you would compile a book that's just a sahih sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because, huh? Ishaq ibn Rahawai. Ishaq ibn Rahawai. Um, and then Bukhari says, فَوَقَعَ ذَلِكَ فِي قَلْبِي فَأَخَذْتُ فِي جَمْعِ الْجَامِعِ الصَّحِيحِ He said, that settled in my heart, it affected me in some way, and I began thinking about composing this book. So that's where the idea first, or maybe not the first, but that's where the idea settled in his heart. Prior to that, the sunnah is there, but the books have mix of all types of hadith. But then by the time of Bukhari's generation, or the generation of his teacher, there was this realization we need to purify the books, the reports, and try to sift out what's authentic versus what's not. Um, also, there's a dream that Bukhari has, he references. Um, and the dream is that Imam al-Bukhari says, I was following the Prophet Wasallam, And I had a fan, one of those hand fans. And I was just warding off flies from Rasulullah Wasallam. So and he was perplexed by that dream. That was his dream. So he has some individuals and eventually um, it was interpreted to him that you would be purifying the Sunnah of the Prophet So it's a combination of things, his, his great learning, his genius mind, the idea of his teacher, and his dream that he had that kind of made him compile or come up with this idea of just bringing the best reports, undisputedly authentic reports of the Hadith of the Prophet. So that's another reason. If that's the case, then why would someone like that bring all these sound hadith and just take a few and put them in a book? Right? Then that defeats the whole vision and purpose, right? So it could not have been a random selection. Reason number three, the contents of the Sahih itself. We look at the stats about the book. So from in the Sahih, uh, more than two thirds of the hadith of the Sahih comes from nine companions. How many companions were there from Hadith 101 now? Ballpark. 100,000, closer to 100,000 companions. There's closer to 124,000. There's different views, but that's that's the ballpark figure. You have 100,000 companions. The vast majority of Hadith in the Sahih comes from nine of them. If you were doing a random selection, I would probably try to take as many companions as I can. So that doesn't make sense. Um, Bukhari had 1,080 teachers. He learned hadith from 1,080 teachers. 
How many of those teachers in the Sahih? All of them or some of them? It's 320, one. So out of a thousand teachers, he only selected 321 of his teachers to include their reports in the Sahih. And he goes further. More than half of the Sahih is from only 20 teachers. So the majority of the book comes from 20 teachers. So why would he leave the rest out? How would he leave the rest out? So if this was a random selection, why is there such a small selection panel, right? You do something random, you would try to say, okay, I already got a hadith of Abu Huraira, let me bring a hadith of this companion you never heard of. I already got a hadith of my teacher, Abdullah bin Yusuf. Let me bring a teacher, this teacher I met, you know, that no one knows about. So you would kind of do that. So, you know, so why so little repetition? Why such a small selection panel? And number four, the fourth reason why it could not have been a uh, random selection is has to do with Imam al Daru Qutni. So Imam al Daru Qutni lived 100 years later, and he was a great expert of hadith, uh, especially Ilal, hadith criticism. So he has a book called Al Ilzam wa Tatabu'ah. Al Ilzam wa Tatabu'ah. So it's a great work. It's a criticism of Sahih al Bukhari, a critique. And it's a critique of Sahih al Bukhari, and it's a great work, but the critique actually raised the stature of Bukhari because he attempted to critique the book and he has some difference, some points, and a lot of points he just conceded, well, maybe Bukhari is right here. So, but what was the essence of that criticism? Ilzam means from alzama, lazim. What is lazim? Necessary. Ilzam. What form is that? Arabic students, your Arabic teacher is here. So, I'm going to test you. Uh -huh. Ilzam, what form? Fourth, yeah. So, lazima is to be next to somebody, or close to somebody. Alzama, the fourth form. Alzama yulzimu is ilzaman means to obligate something, okay? So ilzam is, so, il, so half of the book were ilzam. Ilzam means those hadith reports that Bukhari was obligated to include and he didn't. So in other words, the, the reports that he missed out on. So Bukhari, uh, Qutni has a critique. These are all the reports Bukhari missed. He should have put them in there. So. If Bukhari made a random selection, that makes no sense. If someone has a, just a selection, then how could anyone say you, you should have put this hadith in there? Like ilzam, ilzam is a little more than should. It means like he should have, he, he, he missed these hadith, they're on his conditions, and he missed it, they should be in there. So if it was a random selection, that makes no sense. But Daruputni knew Bukhari, he knew his work. The early expert, they knew that what he was trying to do was include the strongest hadith that existed and not leave anything out. It was a comprehensive uh, you know, work. And at the tabor, the second half of the work, are those reports that he has in there that don't fit his condition, he shouldn't have put in there. That's the second half. So it's a criticism, a critique of Bukhari's inclusions and his exclusions. So remember I mentioned yesterday, Bukhari's genius mind, everything that he includes in the book is meaningful, and everything that he excludes is also meaningful. So the fact that there's a hadith that's not in Bukhari has a huge implication for us. Why? Because we understand Bukhari's vision, what he was trying to do. And so did Dara Putni, he understood his vision, and some of the experts. So they knew what he was doing. That's why they could write a book like that, il accusing him of things that he missed out on. If it was just a muhtasar selection, random selection, that makes no sense. So now, okay, I have a slide actually. I'll summarize. Here's a great quote that summarizes this issue from Imam Ibn al Jawzi, the great Hanbali scholar, prolific author. So he's someone who understood Bukhari as well. And he says here, you know, why didn't somebody read? Somebody take this mic and read the quote for us. You can assign someone.
Yeah, you can read from the screen. I don't have it on the page. It's on the screen. If you need to get closer, you can. Oh, uh, should be on now. Okay, good. Let's stop here. So he says, the, the is like, so there's some people that messed up. They uh, were heedless. They're heedless of certain people who say the following. So he's speaking about this misconception that in Al Bukhari, Bukhari did not uh, relate every Sahih hadith uh, that he had. And all he narrated was a namudaj. Namudaj is just an example. That's what a random selection is. Just an example, just a random selection. Wa Okay, let's stop here. So he says, um, and the reason he did that so the book wouldn't be long. So there are scholars today, I've heard them say that, well, Bukhari is just a selection. And generally, these are the scholars that promote using weak hadith. And they'll say arguments like this, well, Bukhari just did a selection because he didn't want to make his book too long. And then, so Imam uh, Ibn al-Jawzi says, this is the common misconception. And he said, Abu Bakr al-Ismaili, for instance, he has this misconception. And he quotes Imam al-Bukhari with this quote, this quote of Imam al-Bukhari, which is misunderstood. And he says, he just meant Turuk. And uh, so continue, okay, good. So he says, the proof of that is Dara Qutni, who is a great expert. He compiled those things that Bukhari was obligated to include um, and Muslim. He compiled the book. That they were obligated to include. Um, okay, continue. So okay, yeah. So continue is finish it off. Okay, continue. So he basically says the same thing at the end. He says, this is a proof that, you know, if Bukhari just made a selection like an amuda, just an example, like just random selection, then la yulzimu hushay, that there's nothing that's obligatory for him because you're making a selection anyway. So Ibn al-Jawzi understood this very well. So that, you know what? It's not a random selection. It cannot be a random selection. Um, online students. Sorry about that. Here's a quote. So it could not have been a random selection. Um, so what was it then? Um, so here's what it was. The summary of the matter is that Bukhari Sahih represents an extraction of the purest and soundest reports. That's what he was doing. So from all these reports, um, he had Sahih reports. He picked Asahu Sahih and put them in his Bukhari. Asahu Sahih, the most Sahih of the Sahih reports. That's the only thing that makes sense. So it's not a random selection, but a better word could be extraction. It was an extraction of the soundest reports. And when you understand that, then you know that there's a reason behind every inclusion of Imam Bukhari and every exclusion of Imam al Bukhari. And you also understand from this that, look, if there's a hadith that's not in Bukhari, it's because it wasn't on his conditions. It's extra conditions for the Sahih. Um, and if there's a hadith that he has it in there, it's because it filled, fulfilled those conditions. So there's so many implications that it leads to, like one of the implications, there is no Sahih hadith on the conditions of Bukhari, except that it is already in his book. 
many people attempted over the years to find hadith that fit the pattern of Bukhari, they should have been in there, but every single one of them failed. And one of the individuals, Imam al-Hakim, we talked about him at length in, um, in Hadith 102, that he has al-Mustadrak, an entire work of hadith that he believes should have been in Bukhari and Muslim. The vast majority of the hadith in the book are extremely weak. It's like really poor work. Um, and someone who quotes al Hakim, and in general, it's not really reliable. I'm just going to finish one more point, and then I'll take the questions. Let me read with you, read to you what Shaykh Hakim's conclusions are. He says, this strengthens my own position that there is no single report that has been left out of Bukhari and Muslim that is actually under conditions. There's no such thing on the planet. Any hadith outside of these collections can never be on his conditions. There is reason behind every inclusion of his and every exclusion of his. While the theoretically it may be possible that there is some circulating report that's on their conditions that they could not find, an examination of the history and circumstances of the time make that highly unlikely uh, because Bukhari a Muslim traveled the world and got hadith from every single place. So this is the conclusion of many experts and my own teachers. So the conclusion is that when Imam al-Bukhari says mukhtasar, it doesn't mean necessarily a random uh, selection, but it means an extraction that's based on certain criteria. So he selected from many Sahih Hadith, those were the strongest, undisputed, that people could not dispute. That's what makes the work so special. If you don't understand that paradigm, then um, so many misconceptions would arise. With that, we'll open the floor for questions. Also, mother time as well. Yes. So, I'm done. Did you come in the microphone? So the claim is he only picked the Sahih of the Sahih to put in, in this collection. Yes. So can we use another book of his, like Adwa Mufad, to prove this point? That in that book you have Sahih Adi, but they're not Sahih. Exactly. So, so there's, there's a degree, uh, gradation. So Imam Bukhari has other works as well, like Adab al Mufrad, uh, Kitab Al Fa'al al Ibad, and Khalq al Quran, and others. So, and well, Birul Walidain, very good. Uh, Birul Walidain. Um, so those are hadith books as well. They're not comprehensive and huge, but they're, so and they have hadith in that that are not in his Al Jami or Sahih. That means they're hadith that he found acceptable, but not acceptable enough for this book. So that means, so that's why Muhtasar makes sense because, you know, so, so he has a broad array of Sahih reports. So you can say there's primary tier Sahih and secondary tier Sahih. And that's how, you know, it all makes sense if you look at it that way, because Sahih is not all the same level because Hadith science is kind of subjective. You know, there, you could have, I believe this expert had a good memory. I believe it wasn't so good. So there is going to be a difference at the end of the day. But Bukhari wanted to produce one work that was undisputed. That's the cream of the crop. That's a Sahra Sahih, primary tier Sahih. And then the rest of his books contain secondary tier Sahih or second tier Sahih reports. Um, so he was a little more loose with the rest of the books. So that's why we're studying a book like Sahih Bukhari, al jamar Sahih. And that's why it's so special. Because it's undisputed and contains so much. Um, so that's something really important to know that, you know, um, but there's common charge, you know, all these misconceptions arrive. If you think that it's a random selection, then the gradation between Sahih and, and non-Sahih becomes less, right? Because if you believe everything is all good and this is just a random selection and all these six books are random, and then we have also Tabarani we can take from and outside of the six canon, and you find scholars like that, they're always quoting hadith from Tabarani, hadith from Daylami, hadith from not secondary, but even tertiary uh, books, books that are notorious for fabrication. So that whole scheme doesn't make sense. Like, so it kind of messes up the balance. So you really have to be clear on what Bukhari did and what was his vision. Love on. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Can you please summarize in four sentences? How about one reasons. sentence? For oh, the four reasons. Okay. In four sentences. Okay. The, that the reasons why it cannot have been a random selection. One is 
uh, one is uh, the first one was Bukhari's reasons for compiling the second. That doesn't make sense if it's just a random selection. The reason for his compiling the idea behind the Sahi, that's one. Number two, Bukhari's own scholarship and his historical background doesn't allow for a random selection. Number three, what was my third point? Uh huh. Oh, the contents, yeah. Number three are the contents of the Sahih. So from a thousand teachers, he only took from 321, but he took the most from 20. So the contents of the Sahih show that the selection panel is kind of small and it doesn't look like it was random. So like he's taking from the same 20 best teachers. He's taken from nine companions that are reliable. He's taken from, you know, certain teachers. He's not taken from everyone. So it was a random selection. It should have been from everyone or from a greater panel. That was number three. Number four, the critique of Dara Qutni, his book, al Ilzam al Tatabba. It's kind of an advanced point, but Dara Qutni, he criticized him for leaving some hadith out. So why would you criticize him for leaving something out when you're just doing a random thing anyway? So you see what I'm getting at? So that's number four. And I think that was the final one. Yeah. No, I think that's not accurate. That's been debunked. So this is a fine condition that when you have an isnad. So one of the uh, ideas is that for Bukhari and Muslim, I think Muslim was supposed to be more strict in this scheme, that they had to have proof of liqa. Like to this teacher, you're hadathana Sufyan, you're saying hadathana Sufyan, you need to have proof that you met Sufyan. But that's not the case because uh, you kind of look at history, you kind of look at the students of this teacher, look at the people narrating, you get a sense of who's meeting who. But the proof of liqa is like an extra thing. So that really doesn't appear to be Proof means there's extra proof, like on the side, that these people actually met. Yeah, so that's a side point. So we're not emphasizing that, but because we're looking at the al Jamar Sahih. So al Jamar Sahih is a cream of the crop, but there's more crops. Right? So that's the point, even Bukhari himself used other hadith. So, you know, it's still, you know, you have to see where you're going with this. Like, uh, you know, so it's not that he used everything else. So like, he wouldn't, like he wasn't, he was a believer in Sahih. He spearheaded the Sahih movement. Um, so he wouldn't, someone like Bukhari would not have used the Darif report. It's unimaginable, So, but he would use lesser tier Sahih. So there's like a range of acceptability. So it's, it's something that you have to have a little bit of humility that there is a range of acceptability of hadith. But in today's time, that range people extend to fabricated and weak. And that, that's the problem we're pushing back again. Um, we believe you should take only Sahih reports. And not a Sahih report is a case to be made to stick with the strongest. That is something valuable that has some meaning, that has some value. But there's still a greater realm of acceptability outside of that, but it's not as huge as you think. So for some people, they just, anything it says hadith, it's hadith. There are scholars, I've had teachers, they say, you know, as, as soon as you hear the word hadith, just follow it. And even if it's not strong, the prophet could have said it. So that's a wrong approach. I mean, we disagree with that approach. There's so much in our tradition and the hadith corpus that was fabricated that represents mistakes. Um, and that even people deem as sahih, but it's not, it's a mistake. It's a statement of someone else. That's a zimba. Um, I heard that 
one side of uh, what STEM people can do instead of not. Like, so how do you sort of you know, yeah. put out your due diligence or you know, uh, discussing your involvement? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a broad umbrella. Some there's one approach, just take everything in the name of Hadith. But you know, I think now in our age, you should appreciate there's so much confusion, people leaving Islam, doubting Islam because of fake hadith, things that should never have been in our books. So there's so much like mental anguish that's caused by uh, these reports that are that are weak to fabricated. Um that we shouldn't be defending them. So there's this approach to defend everything because so Shaykh Akram brilliantly he says the reason is that something happened. Hadith were historical reports, pure history where you have to analyze it. But some way, somehow over the time, uh, what happened is they got converted from historical reports to sacred texts. Once you make it a sacred text, then forget it. Then as soon as Hadith, you put your head down and your hand on your heart. And you have to accept it. So if you have that sacredness, you attach that to hadith, then you know people get upset when you criticize hadith, and then um, and when you disparage weak reports, well, it's a hadith, and people say you can act on weak hadith, and they they see it as an affront to the persona of the Prophet So hadith should not be taken as sacred texts; they should be taken as historical reports. You have to corroborate them. Burden of proof is on you. Corroborate that the Prophet actually said it. When he said it, then we take it. But if he didn't say it, we don't care who it comes from. We don't care what scholar said it was so and so, or who's in the chain. So there's sometimes big names. So people become emotional. Who oh, you think you know better than Tabarani, and they start bringing his biography, how big he was. So when you get emotional and you bring that card, the emotional card there, and you look at it as a sacred thing and as religious and then you can't really academically discuss so hadith we have to bring it back to academic discussion historical reports but when they're sound like the genre sahih then we accept them we never reject them but they're still historical reports What do you mean by opposite report? It's something that, uh, you know, like, for example, opposite, uh, uh, something is said about the shaitan, and then something is said about the angel, and they both fit in together. So one is being recognized as a weak, uh, by the mm -hmm. and one is a secondary by the mm -hmm. So the complementary meanings that gives you the opposite side of the coin, basically. Okay, yeah. So, so, so the question is, I guess it would be like an example would be. It's hard to find a clear example, but like suppose there's a hadith, a sound report that says something, and that would imply something else, and then you have a weak report that implies the other thing, like, um, so. The, the, so the point here is the meaning is sound because the sound report tells you that this is what you have to do. And part of what you have to do involves this other thing, but this other thing has a weak hadith. So can we take it? So that's the problem. If you look at what happened with the phenomenon of weak hadith, what happened is probably a scholar said, you know what, this is the sound report. This is what it teaches us. Because it teaches us that we also have to do this. But some student took that statement. We also have to do this and put it under Qara Rasulullah. So that's the problem. So although the meaning is fine, but saying that the Prophet said it is not fine because man mutaamidan min Even if it's the greatest statement, so people say, well, how could it be weak? It's such a beautiful statement. How could it be weak? It's absolutely sound. You believe we don't need to do this? You believe we don't need to pray in the night on uh, Nisfu Sha'ban? You believe we don't have to do this? Of course you have to do it, but we're saying that the Prophet did not say that. And to say something that he did not say, even if it's a good thing, even if he wanted us to do it. But to say Qala Rasulullah is a very serious thing. And we always keep that hadith in mind. Whoever ascribes to me something I did not say, let him be assured of the seed and the helper. He doesn't say 
The prophet didn't say, whoever ascribes to me something evil. He said something I did not say. It could be something good. It could be something that's part of Islam. But he didn't say it. Another scholar said it. And it was mistakenly raised to the prophet. That's, the, that's a huge portion of weak hadith. That's what they are. They're statements of scholars. They're wise sayings that somebody really wanted the prophet to say it. And somebody unscrupulous just made the prophet say it. And seek knowledge even if it takes you to China. Like the famous example. So beautiful, it's so sound, and it sounds so cool for interfaith. 1400 years ago, our prophet said, seek knowledge, it's mathematics and this and that, and even if it takes you far away as China. So it sounds so cool, but like, that's what it was. It's that cool element made someone just jump the gun. But that's the whole problem. You have to be fair, and you have to be academic. You, know, you can't say something the prophet did not say. Yeah, so that's... <laughs> Guess what, guys? What? <laughs> that's wrong either. The meaning is strong, but but it's not a hadith. Paradise uh, at the feet of your mothers. There's many hadith like that because they're so cool. They're so important. They they're so inspiring. So people just have this pressure. There's a pressure to make it a hadith. And some way along the line, you know, so there's do some narrator reporters, either maliciously or unintentionally, just raise it. Forget to stop at Qala Sufyan, they'll say Qala Sufyan, Qala Rasulullah. So many, many statements like that. Any hadith that has a fiqh hadith, you have to make wudu like this and support like one madhab or another. So if the Prophet is speaking like a faqih, you know that's a faqih statement that got elevated to a hadith. And there are many examples like that. So the Prophet did not speak the language of fiqh. He was not a faqih like in that sense. He wasn't speaking latter day terminology. If you have latter day terminology that's put in the words of the Prophet in many examples, that's an exa that's a case where it just got elevated. So it's 8.58, let's take a break for Maghrib prayer. Online students, we will resume at 9.15, inshallah, 9.15. Okay. okay, so I want to say a word or two about the books we're going to be reading. So uh, I passed around three copies of the Sahih, the first page of the Sahih, that includes the Hadith that we're studying. So one of them is from my book, uh, this Turkish edition of Sahih Bukhari, which I like. So if you look at, I think this is mine. No, this one is mine. We didn't get them, we have them up here. So this particular one, um, online students. So if someone can volunteer to take a picture and just post it on the Telegram group, the online students can see. So this is the version that I have. Um, it's four volumes, Sahih al-Bukhari. It's um, the critical edition is from Allama Muhammad al -Dihni. But if you can see, like, I love reading books with everything on the page. There are many different types of fonts and printings and versions of Sahih. But when you have something like this, and that's traditionally how it's been written. You have Bab in like a bold. It kind of separates the chapter of Bab. You can see it's a chapter. Um, so take one of each. This one? Okay. Okay. So this is two pages. Okay. So you can see, like, it's, it's kind of beautiful when you read it. Qala Shaykh al Imam al Hafiz and Bab Kayf al Badu al Wahi ila Rasulillah. If you, anyone wants to see the books themselves, this is mine. And our brother Ibrahim here has his own version, which he had many years ago. It's even nicer. It's like in color. And it's the same exact edition, but it's uh, from a different printing. So it's so beautiful. When you read it, it's so beautiful. You can see Hadathana Bab, it separates the Hadith. So, you need a version or a copy of Sahih Bukhari that you can read and for the rest of your life. So it's it's good to invest in one now, so that we can. Um, so, um, but how how are we going to do this? It's going to be quite a challenge because these are Arabic books; they're not available here. You have to get them from Cairo, Istanbul, or when you're in the uh, Haramain, for instance. 
Um, you have um, another version. Oh, yes. Okay. So this one is an older version. I, I believe this is the same one that I gave out on the, yes. So this is this one. Um, is it this one or the other one? This one. The one with the two pages? I'll tell you right now from the first page. Yeah, the modern ones are a lot easier, you're right. But, um, so, Hadefana, well, it's a little different. It's not exactly the same, but but it's it's similar. So feel free to come up here, look at these copies uh, before you invest in one. But this is the the second one is one that's two pages. So you can see Kitab Badul Wahi. This is a very authoritative uh, edition um, that has all the tashkilat. It's very easy to read. Um, and then you have a third one, which is this one here. And this is a little older and harder to read, but it's all of them are pretty much the same pattern. So if you get one of these that are really nice to read, um, all the hadith are on the page. Um, some of the modern editions, what happens is, you know, they have a lot of footnotes. So you have only like one or half a hadith on a page. And then after that, there's a lot of footnotes. So it's hard to read something like Imagine reading the Quran, and there's like two verses on the page, and like 50 lines underneath it as a tafsir. Then the next, that's tafsir. But to read Quran is very difficult like that. So I would suggest reading or getting copy of the Sahih that's just Sahih Bukhari with minimal footnotes. So you can have your notes somewhere else or on the sides, but at least you have a substantial number of hadith on the page. And use any of these beautiful editions. There's Dar of Tasi, there's all these other editions as well. Um, but these are the few that I have at my disposal here. Um, I gave you three samples. So for at least for um, this hadith, and maybe even the second hadith you can read from here. Um, one of them I sent you the PDF. Um, it's available in the, the, the links that I gave you. So, um, you know, you can read any of these. All of these are available by PDF. So PDF is not an issue. But the issue would be getting it in print. And so that would be a problem. So the camera is off. I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to talk about manuscripts, but not today. I'll talk about that maybe tomorrow. So I wanted to move on and read the hadith itself. So let me bring my slides back. There is so much interest in Sahih Bukhari. As I mentioned, it's the most widely read book. Um, if you see on the screen for online students and, and people here as well, this is what one of the manuscripts look like. So you can even buy something like this. The whole Sahih Bukhari is available in this style. Like this is a reproduction of one of these manuscripts that exist now in the like Suleimaniya Library in Istanbul, for instance. So um, I'll bring that tomorrow. I have a copy of purchase, but it's harder to read uh, in this kind of font, but it's, it's available for you. Um, so whichever one you read, you should try to, just like a Mus'haf, when you recite the Quran, you should have one consistent Mus'haf. They're all the same as Jamal Sahih. Some of them might have some mistakes, but the more popular editions generally, generally they're free of mistakes, but not all of them. Um, so I just wanted to share that briefly, but the manuscripts itself, we're going to discuss that tomorrow, inshallah, um, which edition and manuscript we're going to be using. So let's come back to our hadith and end by reading the hadith itself, and because there's a number of things we still have to discuss. So, so if I take this microphone, this hold on to it. Um, someone's going to read again from the beginning. Bab Kaifa Kana Bad Wahi. So you can assign one.
رسول الله قال صحيح الامام والحافظ ابو عبيد الله عبد الله محمد محمد بن اسماعيل بن ابراهيم بن المغيره البخاري رحمه رحم الله تعالى so you see that whole name is there we covered the biography uh, well not the biography but the lineage and then what does it say after that Amin. Amin. okay next okay so Bab so this is as I mentioned yesterday this is the first chapter so whenever you are going to go through the Sahih you're going to how do you locate hadith in your copy you look at the chapter you have to know what chapter it's in so this is how you find a chapter and sometimes it's hard they're not really written like in a modern way like you know where every chapter is labeled maybe some of the new editions have that um, so you go to an index every chapter is there but you'd have to skim through. You have to find the kitab first, and then find the bab. So there's a bunch of kitabs, a bunch of books. So Sahih Jamia Sahih is a bunch of books, uh, is a number of books, and each book has a number of chapters. And then each hadith in there, it begins with the hadith. You can see in this particular one that we're looking at, um, it might be different for the copy that you have a hadathana in large print. You have hadathana, and that's where you know the hadith begins here. And then the next large hadathana is the next hadith. So that's how this is broken up. Okay, so after Bab. Good. So how was the beginning of revelation to the Messenger of Allah? Okay. Now let's switch up. You you pass it on to someone else. Continue of Kaulila. Of Kaulila, Janda Dikuru, Inna Ohaina, Ida Kakama Ohaina, Ida Nuhin, one of the Nina and Dali. Okay, good. Let's stop there. So, this is the first verse. Okay. We talked about this verse yesterday, but we didn't finish the entire point here. So, this verse. So we mentioned yesterday, the first thing Bukhari begins with is a verse. The first content in the Sahih is a Quranic verse. And that's where you'll find with him. He's always going to bring Quranic verses first, privilege them over the Hadith. And this verse is from Surah Al-Nisa, uh, verse number 163. And I mentioned this verse is the most comprehensive verse that contains the names of more prophets than any other verse. Inna awhayna ilayka kama awhayna ila nuhin wa nabiyyina min ba'di. We reveal to you, Ya Muhammad, the way we reveal to Nuh and the Nabiyyin after him. And then it continues, he doesn't quote the rest of the verse, but the rest of the verse, Wa awhayna ila Ibrahima, wa Ismaila, wa Ishaqa, wa Yaquba, wa al-Asbati, wa Isa, wa Ayyuba, wa Yunusa, wa Haruna, wa Sulaiman, wa Aatayna Dawud Zabura. So, you have to think why. The chapter is how revelation began. So now he's teaching Imam Bukhari first wants to teach us about revelation. That's his first, um, you know, it's the first thing he wants to do, teach us about revelation. So he brings this verse linking the revelation with the prophet. That's what revelation is. It's what Allah reveals to the prophets. So it's an interesting verse, an interesting connection, but the deeper you go into the Sahih, the more treasure you will unearth. There are individuals in the world that have spent their entire life studying Sahih Bukhari, and they're still uncovering insights, uncovering wisdom, uncovering gems. Um, Sheikh Akram made a comment once that I spent almost 40 years studying Sahih Bukhari. I've never stopped discovering new things, and I'm confident if I have, we were given multiple lifetimes and I keep reading this book, I'll keep discovering new things. Because that's the nature of, you know, uh, brilliant people, genius minds, and that are inspired by Allah to create something incredible. To create something incredible, it just has its own effect. So, as I mentioned yesterday, no other human being gets his name mentioned after Allah, and the Messenger, and then Rawahu Bukhari. That's a great stature. So there's something remarkable about this book. So 
What is it about this verse? You can even dig, dig deeper. Okay, the verse is about prophets and messengers. So, you know, this book is about the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu So Bukhari wants to teach us that the revelation came to all the prophets before the prophet, and the final prophet and the final revelation is here. But it's even deeper than that. So what's the connection here um, with these prophets? Why this particular verse? There are other verses that could have fit. So one of the insights that Shaykh Akram got from his teachers, uh, Shaykh Shahbaz the Salah, he was a great scholar um, in Nadwatul Ulama. So he was a scholar who he learned many things from. And he had a brilliant way of thinking. He said he learned something from him about this verse in the Sahih that he never heard from anyone else. And whoever he mentioned to uh, wound up being amazed by it. And so Sheikh Shahbaz used to say that Allah mentions two types of prophets in this verse. He mentioned Nuh and Isa and Musa and Dawood. So some of the prophets received a book. The end of this verse is what? So there were prophets that Allah sent a physical book to, revelation. But then there were other prophets Allah did not send a book to, but they received revelation. So it was non-scripture revelation, you can say. So for instance, Ismail, did he receive a book? Ishaq, did he receive a book? No. Yaqub, Asbat, no. Isa, yes, the, the Injil. Uh, Ayu, no, no book. Yunus, no. Arun, no. Suleiman, yes, Zabur. Uh, Suleiman and Daud. So, um, so what the deeper insight here is that Bukhari wants to teach us that revelation is two types. Revelation is that which you recite that Allah reveals as a book like Quran and Injil and Zabur. But then revelation is also what Allah inspires and teaches the prophets. That's not something recited. So the teachings of the prophet is revelation. And just like it was the case with the previous prophets, it is the case with this prophet. So his sunnah is a type of revelation. Because his job will you to complete his job, the task of the messenger was not just to give us the book, but to teach us how to live the book, to teach us what it means. So there are many things that the Prophet received from Allah, and he taught us. That's not in the Quran, that's not part of the recitation of the Quran. So this book, this al jami or sahih is the second type of revelation. So you have Quran, and then you have the second type of revelation, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet And this al jami or sahih is Imam Bukhari's attempt to preserve that sunnah in the most authentic way. And that's why he began with this particular book, with this particular verse rather, that talks about you know, the prophets and the revelation to the prophet, the nature of revelation. So, you know, it's as if he's saying, Allah revealed the Quran to Muhammad Sallallahu and then the second type of revelation is a sunnah, and here it is, giving it to you in your head. So when you think of it that way, it's much deeper, much more profound. So it's you know, these connections are really deep. So the first thing is Kitab al-Wahi, Revelation. What's the next book after that? Who knows what the next book is after that? Someone look it up in your copy. What's the, after Kitab al-Wahi? Kitab al-Iman. And then after that? No, Kitab al-Ilm. So, if you think about these connections, Imam Bukhari is teaching us something. He's teaching us, first, the most important thing is revelation. And then what revelation brings you to? Iman. The next chapter is about Iman. So the revelation is what teaches you uh, about Allah, Azza wa Jal, guides you to Allah. When you come to Allah, you have to believe in Him. So Iman is next. And once you have Iman, now you have to learn what to do? That's Kitab al -ilm. That's number three. And after Kitab al -ilm, then there's Kitab al Wudu, Kitab al Salah, and all the rulings. So a lot of people, they just begin with the fiqh. But the first thing you have to establish what revelation is. So many people don't have that basic foundation. What is the nature of revelation? That's why these hadith in this chapter, there are various types of hadith. They're talking about the nature of revelation, the nature of how Allah communi communicated with human beings. When you establish that nature that there is a God, 
Allah communicated to his prophets. He chose messengers and he brought revelation in these different ways. Um, and then you have to come to what Iman is. Then you have to believe in Allah. So then the next chapter will be Kitabul Iman, building a base of Iman. That's with your mind. You have to realize you know, what it is to believe in Allah and so on and so forth. And then the, the importance of knowledge is next. So it's so brilliant the way Imam Bukhari you know, laid out his book. So when you read the Sahih, try to find connections, try to find why. Ask why in every page. Ask why is this verse here? Why is this chapter here first? Why is that chapter second? A lot of people will begin with the Kitab al ilm They'll say, well, <clears throat> knowledge is the most important thing. That's what we begin with. But you don't even recognize revelation. You don't recognize the nature of prophets. And knowledge is not going to do anything for you. This, you don't even believe in that foundational knowledge. You have to know what knowledge is. But first, you have to know what revelation is. That's the source of the knowledge. And then you have to realize Iman comes next. Once you, you believe in Allah, then knowledge comes next. Then worship comes next. And worship is the most important thing is salah. That's first. But prior to salah is kitab al wudu. Because before you pray, you have to make wudu. There's a logical connection with everything. And the more you think about it, the more profound the lessons you'll find you discover from this particular book. So now let's continue reading the hadith. Now let's finish this hadith, hadith one today. Somebody else read. Hadathana. حدثنا الحميدي قال حدثنا سفيان قال حدثنا يحيى بن سعيد الانصاري قال اخبرني محمد بن ابراهيم الطيبي انه سمع القمه بن بقاص الليثي يقول سمعت عمر عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه على المنبر قال سمعت okay stop here let's do this not first so we mentioned that this is the hadith of nia and we mentioned that so Imam Bukhari relates this hadith seven times in the Sahih, all from different teachers. And I, we made this point yesterday uh, that why did he begin with this particular teacher? There has to be a reason. It's not random. He could have brought another hadith. Um, he could have brought another, it's not rather, of this hadith from another teacher. But if you think about what the chapter is, beginning of Revelation, where did Revelation begin? It was in Mecca. So he picked his best teacher from Mecca to start with. So uh, al Humaydi, he was a sahib of Imam al-Shafari. And he was uh, someone who's, Humaydi learned from who? After Humaydi, what does it say? Hadathana, Sufyan. So this is Sufyan ibn Uyayna. We did his biography in Hadith 102. So I won't mention the entire biography here, but Sufyan ibn Uyayna died in the year 198. So he was the muhaddith of Mecca, of the Haram. He was one of the most famous muhaddithin in, in Mecca. So many people learned from him. He met all four Imams of Fiqh. So he was a contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa and Malik. So he met them, but he didn't learn from them. They were contemporary, they were the same level. But Shafi'i and Ahmad were his students. They both sat and learned hadith from him. So someone like that, you know, is special. Um, his teacher in Quran was Ibn Kathir of Mecca, one of the ten Imams. Um, and he read the whole Quran by the age of four, began writing hadith by the age of seven. So one of his best students was Al-Humaydi. He had thousands of students. So that's another thing about this Islam. Imam al-Bukhari, he wants to pick the best of the best. So he could have picked someone who narrates from Sufyan, someone else. But he had another reason. He wanted to pick someone from Mecca. But not only that, Al-Khumaydi spent 10 years learning from Sufyan. So that's something important for Bukhari. That's important for the soundness of an Isnad. Bukhari is looking for the top names, the top experts, not random people. So every single Isnad is because that's the best of the best. For Sufyan, he has specific people he takes from their students. Although there's thousands of people that were his students. And he has Isnad from all of them or many of them, but he will pick the best of them. So al Humaydi, someone who spent 10 years with Sufyan ibn Uyayna, reading hadith, rereading them, learning them again and again, that person is not gonna be the same as one person who goes to Sufyan, meets him for one day, learns five hadith, and comes back and teaches you the hadith. So that person can make mistakes. That's something really important as the student-teacher relationship, those students who spent 10 years with the teacher, 
Of course, if the student spent a week with the teacher, a very different qualitative week. So these are things, these are the things that people like Bukhari and Muslim are looking at in Islam. Not just random people that learn, but the best of the students. So that's why this is not the first Islam he shares with us is one of the best Islams. And it's it's a solid Islam, one of the strongest Islam. But let's finish the name first. So you have Sufyan. After Sufyan, you have who? Yahya ibn Sa'id al Ansari. Al Ansari means what? Where do you think he was from? Medina, yes. So he was a great scholar of Medina for the second generation. Uh, Yahya ibn Sa'id was one of the a student of the seven fuqaha of Medina. You know, we talked about them in Hadith 101. But he was someone who learned from Anas ibn Malik, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Al Qasim ibn Muhammad, and many, many others. And he's the one who made this hadith popular. So prior to him is one person. From Yahya ibn Sa'id, over 200 people learned this hadith. And it reached us today. His grandfather, his grandfather Qais, was a companion. Uh, his students were people like Malik, Sufyan Athori, Sufyan ibn Uyayn, and others. Imam Ahmad said about Yahya ibn Sa'id, Yahya ibn Sa'id athmatun nas. He's the most reliable of people. And Sufyan ibn Uyayna used to say, the hadith experts of Arabia, of Hijaz, are Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, Yahya ibn Sa'id, and Ibn Juraj. So Yahya ibn Sa'id was a great person. He died in the year 143. So he's from Medina. And now his teacher is who? Who's the next person in Islam? Muhammad ibn Ibrahim at Taymi. So he was, at Taymi is which tribe? Anyone know which companion was Taymi? Which of the famous companions was at Taymi? From Banu Taym. Uh -huh. Which companion was from Banu Taym, a famous companion? Who was the most famous companion? Companion, Sahaba. Abu Bakr, yes. Abu Bakr was Taymi, Banu Taymi. So he was a cousin, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim was a cousin of Abu Bakr. So he was, his grandfather was companion, but he was a great scholar of Medina. And uh, he died in the year 120. So Muhammad ibn Ibrahim is from Medina. So now you look at the Isnad, that's also meaningful. The first person, the teacher of Bukhari and his teacher, both from where? Mecca. So number one, number two, from Mecca. Number three and number four, from Medina. So there's a lesson here within the lesson. There, how did Revelation begin? It began with Mecca and then it moved to Medina. And now you can see that in Islam. That's not random. Um, and then you have after him, who? Mm -hmm. but those are the last yeah, yeah. So Imam Bukhari just linking himself with his Meccan teacher, and then his Meccan teacher, and then to a Medinan teacher, to a Medinan teacher. Um, and then the rest is Medina up until the Prophet. So that's like a logical progression. So who's above Ibrahim, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim at Taymi? Al Qama ibn Waqas al Bayfi. So he was also a reliable scholar of Medina, but we don't know much about him. He narrates just a few hadith. We don't know when he died. All we know, he died in the reign of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, which was from 65 to 86 of the Hijri calendar. So somewhere in this, probably in the 70s or 80s of the Hijri calendar, al qaba ibn Waqas died. He was a student of Umar ibn Khattab, Aisha ibn Umar, Amr ibn al-As, and many others. <laughs> So he was someone who was deemed trustworthy by the early experts. So these, this is the Isnad, and from al qama you have Umar ibn al-Khattab. So this represents the most authentic type of hadith. So for a number of reasons. One, if you look at every level, almost every level is Hadathana. Then you have Hadathana, Hadathana, and then Akhbarani, and then Sami'a al qama and then Yaqulu Sami'atu Umar. Every single link here has sama, has hearing. It's not an, it's not something vague. I narrate from. So, and that's another 
great lesson here, Imam Bukhari is starting his Sahih, showing you what the most authentic, or one of them, uh, what an authentic Isnad looks like. Every single level here, Sami'atu Hadathana Akhbarana, which means I heard from the teacher. There's no ambiguity in that connection. Okay. Uh, what is my camera keep doing? Okay. The other thing about this is not, it's important to note that Al Qama, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim, and Yahya ibn Sa'id are all Tabi'im, same generation. So it's not always the case in Isnad, you have one generation and a generation above. Sometimes they're narrating sideways, horizontally. And here you have horizontal transmission in three generations, uh, in three names rather, three links, but they're all the same generation. That makes it's not kind of long. Sometimes the Isnads are a lot shorter. The second thing about this is not is that this is a hadith that is gharib. So what does that mean? From Umar ibn al-Khattab, only Al-Qama narrated this hadith. From Al-Qama, only Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al -Taymi. From Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al -Taymi, only uh, Yahya ibn Sari narrated this hadith. From Yahya, you have hundreds of people that got this hadith. So because there's one at these three links, at any link, if there's one person, hadith is termed gharib. Okay. Just, that's Hadith 102, just to show you. Um, so Gharib doesn't necessarily mean that it's inauthentic, right? So that's the point here. For Bukhari, there's a misconception. Bukhari wanted every Hadith to have two people in every link. It has to be Aziz, and that's a misconception. This Hadith is Gharib. So these numbers weren't that important to early Muhajjateen. As long as the people were solid, there's a solid chain of command, each person heard from the person above, the hadith doesn't have any defects, then it's solid. You don't necessarily need a whole bunch of people to marry the hadith. Okay? So that's the isnad. Any questions on the isnad? Obviously, uh, I was just thinking from the Hadith, and all these things. That's Aqidah, right? Yeah. Is that Aqidah? Yeah, but there's Kitab al Iman here, and there's whole chapters of Aqidah here. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, like, uh, deal with these things? Because it is, it's just, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, So, I mean, the truth, I mean, you have to speak the truth in, in, and, and teach people, and this kind of teaching takes time, and so we have to deconstruct this idea of looking at numbers. The latter Islamic tradition has been obsessed with numbers. So this idea of mutawatir, like the idea of tawatir is very problematic, although it's so widespread, everyone uses it. So there's this idea you need many for many in order for something to be sound, and so, you know, we talked about that a lot, but so this is all the same. If you study Imam al-Bukhari, everyone recognizes his stature. People just don't know. Uh, people aren't aware of his methodology. And we show that, you know, Bukhari, he wasn't looking for numbers. He was looking for solid people. And as long as a solid person brought him something and he was confident that it came from that person, ultimately to the Prophet so that was good enough. He did not need corroboration. But Bukhari did look for corroboration when there was a doubt. So. So solitary transmission of hadith is not necessarily a bad quality. Um, so Al-Hakim was the one who would spread this misconception that Bukhari required two transmitters at each level. He's one of the people who had that misconception. And it's not true. So the fact is Bukhari would only look for corroboration in cases that warranted it. Sometimes there's something that sounds off or something that might contradict, then you need corroboration. But it's not a general rule. And there are many cases of hadith that are in the Sahih that are uh, gharib, they're solitary, even in matters of aqidah. But then there's a compromise some scholars came up with. Well, okay, for every matter, it's okay to take a solitary hadith. But for aqidah, we can't take ahad hadith, or hadith that are narrated by one or a few people. But, you know, that's, you know, it sounds cool, it sounds right, but the fact is almost all the hadith out there are ahad anyway. What the water hadith don't really exist. But it's really a theoretical like discussion. And so it's just 
it's very problematic. So we have to teach uh, what's important. What's important are those five conditions of what makes narration sahih, that makes knowledge strong. And none of those five conditions have to do with numbers. So it's not a numbers game for us, but it's the quality of Islam. So Bukhari, instead of numbers, he's looking at quality. He's looking at the top students of each narrator. But Sufyan, for instance, he takes people like Khomeidi, Ali ibn Madini, but not others. So for Amr ibn Dinar, the best narrator is Sufyan. For Zuhri, their best students. So he's looking at every teacher, every, he's looking for the best students of that teacher. And that's what Islam is going for. But he's not really looking for numbers. So you just have to, I mean, when someone's making an announcement, you mention an announcement, that's not the time to stand up and scream and say something. But you have to teach in your own way. Um, and if someone's not looking or asking you something, sometimes intruding is counterproductive. So you have to create your circles of students. You have to, when you have opportunities, say things in a respectful way you teach people. Um, but even this idea of an aqidah, there's the numbers where it says non aqidah matters is problematic. And it's really it's silly, it's really not true. And it cannot be true because it's theoretically impossible. The Akram says there's not a single hadith in the world that's mutawatir. You really look at it, it's not. Like you could make a case for like a dozen maybe. But do you know, like this, everyone talks about mutawatir hadith. There really is, the number of mutawatir hadith is either zero or 10 or 12, max 100. And that's stretching it. So that means all these hadith in the Sahih, none of them are mutawatir. Like 7,000 hadith, you know, you can make a case for one or two of them. So this, that's how problematic the idea is because that idea leads to rejection of hadith. And you have all these modernists now, well, hadith, how do you know it's true? It's all conjectural and it's zanni and it's only probabilistically true. And it all comes from this, these, these concepts that wrong concepts that were developed in our tradition by people who went to the And it causes so much confusion and problem in the world today. Yes, what I'm Would be weak? Because that's a good question. So the question is, why would a hadith that foundational be gharib? Um, so first of all, it's gharib at the earlier levels. So the problem is at the earlier levels, um, you didn't have formal people sitting and teaching hadith to thousands of students. You didn't have these schools yet. That developed like generation two and three. Generation one, what's happening? People are like conquering lands. People are jihad, people are like establishing Islam. And so there isn't a lot of teaching going on. There's teaching going on, but there isn't formal schools. In the time of the Prophet, some of the early and the Khulafa Rashidin, there aren't formal schools where you're sitting down and teaching hadith to thousands of people. So that's why you don't have a lot of narrators. So, but that doesn't take away from anything because how many hadith did Abu Bakr as Siddiq narrate? Anyone know the number? <laughs> yeah, look it up. But I, um, I remember, you can see if I'm right, 124. But Abu Bakr as Siddiq, he narrated 124. Abu Huraira narrated thousands. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, total is 124, but um, this is from Okay. Does it give you a, t a summary, a total? So, six books. Okay. Okay. So that's so that's about a dozen then, like or twenty maybe from the six books, thirty-eight. So, can you make an argument? Well, Abu Bakr wasn't that knowledgeable because he only narrated thirty-eight hadith. I mean, you can, but it, it makes no sense because you have to understand that the fir first level they weren't, you know. Hadith teaching wasn't a thing. They were just living life, teaching people in their natural circumstances. And they were busy. He was a Khalifa. He was busy fighting war after war. And so the early Islam, like, it wasn't, that's why you don't have dozens of people narrating stuff um, at every level. So 
almost all the hadith are gharib at that level. That's the thing. Because uh, what happens is people do teach more. Than, it doesn't mean, you know, Omar, only one person heard this from him. He was on the mimba. What does that mean? He was in an audience. He had an audience. There was probably a few hundred people there, maybe a few thousand. We don't know what occasion it was, but at least it's going to be a few hundred in Medina. If he's a Khalifa and it's probably on the mimbar, it was probably Jumara, um, or it could have been just giving an address. But so, so many people did hear it, but not everyone who hears teaches someone else. And people do teach others, but not every, it's not survives. Not every book survives. So many people teach and write their books and have it's not, but it doesn't survive the test of time. So these are the, when it, from Bukhari and these early experts, they're looking for the best. Sometimes the others get ignored. It doesn't mean they didn't exist when they were. So historically, there must have been other Isnads for this hadith. But in the books, only this one survived. But that wasn't a negative thing. Okay, that's, I'm going to get to that next. That's what I wanted to get. That's a good point. Um, so, Sahih al-Bukhari relates, uh, Imam Bukhari relates this hadith of the Niyya seven times. And the Matan in the other times is just like the one in the Arbari. So, so every single time it has, so in Bukhari, so here's the thing. So, the text of the hadith, Inna mal a'malu bin I'm not going to explain the hadith because we did that in the Arbaeen class. So, uh, verily actions are by intentions and every man will get what he or she intended. So, man kanat, so, hijratuhu ilallahi wa rasulihi, fa hijratuhu ilallahi wa rasulihi, wa man kanat hijratuhu li dunya yusibuha, aw imra'atin yantihuha, fa hijratuhu ila ma hajara ilayhi. That's how it is everywhere. In Arbaeen. Whoever migrates for Allah and his messenger, his migration is for Allah and his messenger. Whoever migrates for a worldly matter or to marry a woman, then his migration is for what he or she intended. So that's how the hadith exists everywhere else. So, but when you read this hadith here, it's missing something. So look at your thing, what is it missing? It's missing that first part. Whoever migrates for Allah and his messenger, it's not there. So. So that's an issue we need to discover. I mean, so why is it missing there? Is it a mistake? Um, so you might say, well, Bukhari, maybe he made a mistake. And, but now if you look up this hadith in the other portion of Bukhari, and six other times, it's there. Now you realize, wait, it can't be a mistake. The Bukhari knew it, and the other portions, he did write it. So it's not a mistake. Um, what other possibilities are there? Um, it could be that, well, maybe from this particular teacher, you heard it like that. That's a possibility. Maybe from uh, his teacher, who was his teacher, Hamedi, you heard it like that. Some people have said that. But now, how do you solve that problem? Hamedi had a musnad, his own book of hadith. If you look up the musnad of Hamedi, it's there. And that is Hijrat al or so it's there. So, What's going on? Bukhari took it out. So he took it out. So he dropped that part of the hadith. So now you have to think why. So the, the, the problem with Sari Bukhari, like, he doesn't explain himself. That's not a problem, it's a problem for us. But like, you know, people who are geniuses, they don't need to explain themselves, they just do their thing. Right? Like today you have to say, hey guys, I'm about to do this. Hey guys, look what I just did. Hey guys, and then you put a this is what it means. I just said this, but this is what it means. So that dumbs down our minds. But Bukhari, he was doing these incredible things. So the issue here is Bukhari took this portion out for a reason. And if you look at, compare all the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, all the different, the same hadith that appear in different portions, sometimes some are long, sometimes, sometimes it's only a portion that he quotes. So he had this fluid way of narrating hadith. So Bukhari had a fluid way of narrating hadith. And that was different from Muslim. Muslim was more exact. The hadith, this is the hadith beginning to end, here it is. But Bukhari, he was, he was plain. He had a brilliant methodology. He was trying to teach you so much between the lines. And when you're doing something like that, then you do more things with what you have. So he was quoting hadith, parts of hadith, 
and he was quoting hadith in different chapters, the same hadith in 12 chapters to prove 12 different things, learn 12 different things and insights. So question is here, we know he took this portion out and there's nothing wrong with that. Like if, if I have to quote a hadith, like al how many of you quoted the hadith? Al hey guys, actions are with intentions. And you just stopped there, you didn't quote the rest of it. Can I criticize you? Well, hey, wait a minute, you stopped, you didn't quote the rest of the hadith, that's not right. No, you're allowed to quote a part of the hadith and to leave out a part. That's, that's natural, that's what all people did. So that's what Bukhari did here, but still, why did he do that? Why he took this portion out? So you have to think, you know, this is the first hadith in the book. He's producing this brilliant masterpiece that he knows people are going to appreciate, like thinkers are going to appreciate. He left behind his legacy. Um, and if you know who he was, he was so pious and humble in his life that um, he, he wasn't one of those people like who's arrogant or like full of himself. He was so humble. He was so pious, like uh, he never backbit anybody. Even someone like Bukhari who left out so many hadith, took only the cream of the crop, you would imagine him to criticize narrators. Even when he criticized narrators, he never used bad words. Uh, he never used words that could come across as backbiting. So the piety of Imam Bukhari, what we believe most likely when he happened, he didn't want to come across as boasting. So imagine I do something amazing and I said, look, whoever does something for Allah and his messenger will be for Allah and his messenger and here's my project. It's kind of saying I'm doing this for Allah and his messenger and bragging about your intention. So he was being very humble, he was being very pious, so he took that portion out. That's so brilliant when you think about it. So like, I mean, it's his personal selection. If you were to do it, maybe you would say, no, I'd rather leave it and let people decide. That's his personal, you know, choice. That's what he did. So the first hadith, imagine he put that there, it would come across, well, how many of us would be saying, look, Khadi is someone who did things for Allah and his messenger. So like, you can't praise yourself like that. So that's probably what it was. You know, that, that's explanation that makes the most sense to me. Um, but we do definitely know that he, he dropped it for a reason. Allahu ta'ala a'ma. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing about a book like this. You can learn so much. You can stop at every word. Just think about it and, and get these insights. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And that's why a book like this deserves to be studied. And, and so many people are intimidated by Sahih Bukhari. Well, it's too big. And let's get a mukhtasar. Let's look at the 40 hadith. Look at what you're going to miss. Look at what you just missed. Look at the Isnad. By reading this, you'll, most people jump to the hadith. So you skip the Islam. Look at what you would have missed from the Islam. Look at what he's teaching. Look at his brilliance, like Makkah to Medina. And then the second hadith, someone just read the second hadith. That's the first word. Hadathana from who? Abdullah ibn Yusuf at Tennisi. And then? Qala Malik. Yeah. So Malik, Medina. Abdullah ibn Yusuf is from Medina, and he's the best student of Imam Malik. So first hadith starts with Meccan teachers. Second hadith starts with Medinan teachers. Again, he's playing with you. He's teaching you. Revelation began in Mecca and continued to Medina. So only someone who had a complete grasp of all the hadith out there and then deep insight into deen and religion, good Quranic framework can do that. Just like, you know, you know run around us. And we're just like amazed. We're still trying to discover these things today. So that's the brilliance of Imam al-Bukhari. And with that, we finished the first hadith. Um, the first hadith now, the last thing is, how does it fit here in the beginning of Revelation? That's another issue and question. But I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised why people are so perplexed by that. It's so obvious um, because, you know, Nia, isn't that central to Revelation? Like, you know, the purpose of Revelation is to teach you to be, do things for Allah and only for Allah sincerely. So there's a verse in the Quran that's relevant here. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ 
وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمُ This hadith says, this verse says, we have only, can, only commanded them this. Who's we? Allah. Who's them? The messengers. We have only commanded them one thing. يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ خُنَفَا To worship Allah with sincerity, sincerely. And only then, يُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ And that's why following that verse, you know, first is revelation, the first hadith is niyyah, it's perfectly. And then the double salah comes after some chapters. So first niyyah, revelation, then salah. So he's trying to teach you that. So, so Shaykh Akram keeps, explains it like this. Look, this book, Sahih al-Bukhari, is teaching you the deen, the whole deen, your guidance, the whole process of deen. But the first thing he wants to show you is the beginning and the end. The beginning and the end of the purity of your intention. Everything that you do in your life, if it's not for Allah, it's a waste. You know, what's the verse? Aqsarina uh, a'mala, right? In uh, Surah Al-Kahf. What's the verse at the beginning? I forget. Yuhsinuna suna, right? Those are, who are the most deluded people who thought they were doing good, but then they got nothing out of it because your whole deen has to be oriented on the purity of intention. So that's the end result and the goal of your guidance. So the goal, he's putting, giving you the goal goalposts first. So the whole deen will make sense if it's connected to that goal, the purity, niya. If your niya is not there, then nothing will make sense. Kitab al-Iman will not make sense. Ilm will not make sense. Salah is useless. Wudu is useless. Everything is useless. So this is, there's so many things they can derive from here. The class, purity of intention, the end result of faith and revelation. And then, so the sequence is, is, is perfect and is amazing. So we, I think we made an insight, uh, Imam Burhan was there in the last class, uh, that the end goal of Islam, when you disconnect that end goal, which is for Allah, then the deen becomes a culture, right? So. That end goal is purity directing towards Allah. When that is gone, then everything you're doing becomes just an identity and a culture. And that's what happened in Judaism. So in Judaism, they have structure, but no purpose. So one way of looking at it is purpose and structure. It was uh, Imam Wahyuddin who gave, up, gave us that insight in the, the previous seminar. He says, Jews, they have structure, but no purpose. Why? Because they don't believe in afterlife. They have all the rules, kosher laws, all these things they do. It's kind of like the fiqh of our fiqh, but they have no purpose. Most of them don't even believe there's an afterlife. So they have structure without purpose. But the Christians, what do they have? Christians have purpose with no structure because they got rid of the law. Just you have to love God and the, you know accept Jesus and you're saved. You don't have to do anything. So the, the structure is gone, but the purpose is there. They, they do believe in God and they, afterlife and heaven, they have a strong concept of that. But Muslims, you have the perfect balance. You have structure and you have purpose. So the purpose is ikhlas or niyyah, purity of intention. The structure is the deen itself. And this whole sahih is going to teach you that structure. Um, and, but you have to have that purpose in mind. That balance has to be there. So many Muslims, they lose that balance. When you lose that balance, there are Muslims that are oriented to fiqh so much, they're like Jews. All they care about are the rules and not the purpose, right? It's all about the rules, ultra conservative interpretation of the rules. They're just like the Jews. But then there's also Muslims that are like the Christians. It's all about intention and just loving God and you don't have to pray, you don't have to do anything. You have Muslims like that too. So structure and purpose, that's what Bukhari wants to teach you. Wow. Any online students have questions? That's the class for today. And I will open the floor for questions. Do you mind passing the mic so online people can hear? So regarding this first hadith, then, is it known or is it established that we should not marry this hadith per se because it's leaving out words? No. No, like I said, so I gave you the example. You can't say in the malamalu bini. You tell your child, look, in the malamalu bini, the Prophet said that. Don't you know that? You want to quote the whole thing. There's nothing wrong with quoting parts of hadith. 
There's so many hadith in all the hadith books that are portions. When you find the same hadith in another book that has a larger context and more words in there. So there's nothing wrong with taking a portion of a hadith and, and quoting it. So you can do that, absolutely. But if you're teaching like the hadith of Niyah, then perhaps it's better to use Bukhari's hadith of Niyah for the other chapter because it's more complete. If you're teaching in an academic setting, but there, there are parts you might you might even have to leave out other things. Um, sometimes you know the, the most basic part is in the mal bin niyad. The rest is just an explanation. It was the Prophet's explanation, so you can just take the base in the mal bin niyad and part of the explanation. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's no rule that you have to narrate the entire incident or an entire statement. You can always narrate parts. I'm sure you've done this in any one of your So even if somebody does say Kama Qal is one of the safest things they would tell you, you always say you say Kama Qal Ali Salat So wouldn't that be also like a way of covering Yeah I so, try to do that as a couple of just in case I mess up <laughs> Yeah so the other part of it is that that's like a deeper discussion that hadith is narrated by meaning. So the wording is semi-exact, but not 100%. So you can't say, you know, the word fa is used here and the, um, the prophet used fa. Maybe it was the narrator who put fa there instead of wow, right? So it's the meaning is, is preserved pretty fairly well. And the wording is well preserved also fairly well. But in general, a lot of the hadith are narrated by meaning. But, but Imam al-Bukhari, he wanted to take, that's why he wanted to take the best experts. So, when someone teaches you something, you relate to someone else, you put it in your own words, even if you don't intend to. It always happens naturally. But if there's an expert student that spent 10 years with a teacher, more likely that would be more exact, faithful to the original. So that's why Bukhari was trying to mitigate that problem. But at the end of the day, when you teach, you always put your own words in there. So words can go up and down. So it's not exact word for word. But when Bukhari wrote his he was trying his best to put it the way he learned from his teachers. And now we have exactly what Bukhari has. Uh, so now it doesn't change because now we have the books. But prior to him, it could have been, if you look up Musnad al khumaydi the words might be slightly off. It might be, Ilallahi wa nabihi, instead of Ilallahi wa rasuli. But that's not a big deal. That's how people operate here. So can we say that mimics the early experience of the Quran itself, that it was the Nara? The Prophet Sallam would give an ultimate word, which is more about the ma'ana. And it's just only today we're so fixated, just like we're fixated on the Quran. The Quran? The Quran yeah. yeah, but the Quran was recited in prayer, so it had to have words there. Right? So the Quran was not narrated by meaning. Because the Prophet would teach them how to recite it, and they would recite it, and keep repeating and memorizing. Because that's something you recite in prayer. So in prayer, it wasn't like you could change the meaning. There was ahruf yeah, and the qira'at. But that was that that was this multiplexity that was revealed by Jibri that because to allow different people to accommodate, but it was still within like part of the revelation. It wasn't like you could do whatever you want. Well, there is a view, some people said, you know, some people do have a view that maybe Muslims are allowed to recite Quran with synonyms. But it's not a reputable view, so that's that's a minority view. You know? But the Quran is qualitatively different because it's recited and Prayer and it was taught differently. So Allah's messenger focused on the Quran. He wasn't focusing on hadith. Hadith is just what he said. When you teach Quran, you have to say things, right? That's what hadith was. But the Quran was what he was teaching. There were khutbahs, he was just reciting Surah Qaf. As a female companion, she said, he recited it so much in the khutbah, the whole khutbah Surah Qaf that I memorized it, just hearing repeated again and again. So the base of the prophetic teaching was Quran. That's what he was sharing with the mushrikeen. That's what he was sharing with his companion. That's what he was teaching. It wasn't like, hey, then memorize this in the Mal'arma of Binia. No, he was teaching the Quran. And sometimes he would explain things and elaborate or answer a question. That's what becomes a hadith. So you always have to bring it back to the Quranic base. The Quranic base is pretty fairly exact word for word. You know, plus the Qur'an. That's a different class, though. Yes.
I, I know the word, so when, when I did the other one, one of the things they strongly emphasize on, maybe you can maybe check some more, like I've noticed whenever I mention the opinion, you criticize it, so <laughs> you're giving me the other views. <laughs> well, so one of the things they strongly emphasize was uh, when, when it comes to the Quran, there's two ways of preserving the Quran, one is Kitab and one is Qur'an. So even if it's written a certain way, you will, if you have to go back to the recitation. So even if it's written a certain way, if you see it's recited a certain way, you will follow the recitation, because if you're preserving the Quran through the recitation, obviously Kitab is just something that's added. And we take that as like the foundation that we can use. I don't know, is, can you ask that question? Yeah, so the, Quran, so the Quran was simultaneously preserved in two ways um, in writing from the first day, because the Prophet had scribes, Kitab, and he had scribes, so he would call them. Every time a revelation came, he would run and call Ma'awiyah and the other scribes and, hey, write this down. Allah revealed this and they would write it down. So from day one, it was written down and it was memorized, so it was simultaneous. So it was just like an extra safeguard, but but both of them corresponded to each other. The writing and the, the recitation is the same thing. So in the early period, it was exactly the same thing. But then what happened is, this when these Qara'at uh, were taught, or when the Ahruf were taught rather, it's not Qara'at at that time, it was Ahruf, the various companions, and they went to various regions. Some of them probably made mistakes and created other words, and the variety became too much. And then and some of them might have had the view. There was an early view that you could recite the Quran any way you want, with synonyms and just some of the meanings there. But it wasn't a strong view. It wasn't a view of the great companions because it was so exact. Like Abdullah ibn Masood, the Sahih Bukhari, the Hadith, that he was correcting a student. And he was reciting in the Masadaqatu Lil Fuqarai wal Masakin. So he corrected him, he said, and his mistake was what? Fuqarai wal Masakin. He didn't go long enough. But he said, no, this is not how I heard it. Read it again. And the guy read it again. He said, no, this is not how I heard it. So he said, okay, how did you hear it? He said, I heard the Prophet from Maddaha fil Fuqara. He elongated the Fuqara. So if some, if the companions were like that, even the vowels are so exact. It makes no sense that they were allowing people to read with synonyms. So I don't buy that. I'm not convinced of that view. Uh, it does exist in the literature. Um, so they were fairly exact. And then um, there's an orientalist view that the Musahif of Uthman, they had a skeletal script. So you could have different ways of reading it. And that's how the Qur'at were formed, because there were different ways of reading that skeletal script. But that doesn't make sense if you know the process of Islam and how the Quran was taught and preserved and taught and recited in prayer. So the Quran is qualitatively different. Anyone else? Okay, yeah, pass it on. But you say that the Bahadur uh, don't have, um, they're, they're not preserved in the order of the words, mm -hmm. the words that you use. Doesn't that allow for ambiguity? Because from a, from a theological perspective, there's a lot of things that we look at what the Prophet also used. In terms, like, for example, the, 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 the Hadith of the 73 sects, mm -hmm. and the Prophet also using the Ummah, and that's my Ummah. And so if we open that door, that words may not be preserved in the middle of it, doesn't that allow for a complete ambiguity in the world of the Hadith? Yeah, excellent question. So the answer is, of course it does. So it is what it is. I mean, you would like it otherwise, but there is a lot of ambiguity in, in Hadith and wordings. Famous example is the Hadith of the yeah, of Jibreel, Hadith Jibreel. Right, like the two, three questions first is Iman, then Ihsan, then Iman, then Islam, then Ihsan. Another hadith it has a different order. So we focus so much on the order. Allah's message first said this, but there's another hadith that has a different order. So then the order might not be that significant. So, so the ambiguity is there, we have to deal with it. And right? it's always going to be there. So you can't get rid of it. So, like, you can't get rid of it by being dishonest. So, um, so the main thing here is what 
these scholars are trying to do is trying to preserve the best version of each of these and the best teachers to their best students. So that kind of reduces a lot of the ambiguity. So that's what Bukhari was trying to do. He, was just, he wasn't just taking the hadith from anyone. So when you take it from the best teachers, from the best students, then the versions are, you're more certain about the versions, about the wordings of the versions, right? Um, and the sequence and so on and so forth. But if you read these books, these great books like Fatul al-Bari here, you know, Fatul al-Bari is like 30 volumes. And you read, what is, why does Ibn Qadir spend so much time in each of these, sometimes 30 pages, 100 pages on a hadith? This is what he's talking about. That in this version, we have this, in this version, we believe this is the more likely one, this is the stronger one. Probably this is a mistake of this narrator. So that ambiguity is always going to be there. You have to, like, this is what research is, and scholarly research is, is trying to figure out what the prophet actually said. Um, but the good thing is, you know, it's not ambiguity to the level of, you know, the words are different. The ambiguity is that sometimes the sequence, there are many hadith, like there's a hadith, where the Prophet commanded me three things, number one, this, number two, and number three, I forgot, right? So there's hadith like that too. So, you know, um, some companions are more exact in preserving the wording, some were less exact. So the job of muhaddith is to look at all the different versions, uh, try to sift out which ones are more authentic, which ones are related by more the top experts. And when you go with the expert, those wordings are generally what we rely on. So. That's why Bukhari and Muslim, they were kind of relying on the best versions of each of When you go to Tirmidhi, you add Nasa'i, Numaja, there are so many other versions that are so different. So, but there are various approaches there. For me, like I'm a minimalist uh, when it comes to Hadith, I believe there's too much in our Hadith corpus. So the first order of business for us is to take, eliminate all the non-Sahih. And that should not have much bearing for us. And pick only the Sahih. And from the Sahih, take the Mukhtasar of Bukhari, the Asakh of Sahih. And when you look at Bukhari and Muslim, then the wording is in awe. It's almost exact. So those things that are Muttafaqun Ali, those hadith, the wording is so exact. It might be a flower or a wow, that's natural. That's part of human speech, human language. Um, and that's not something, there's no way around that. That's the problem. Uh, if you read, if you want to read an article on this, like, there's a good article by Jonathan Brown, did the prophet really say it or not? Um, it's about historical uh, accuracy of hadith. So he talks about, he's so brilliant, he talks about the Gettysburg Address. In there. So he says, how many people know there's seven versions of the Gettysburg Address? So something that happened in, you know, within our, not our lifetime, but close to our lifetime, there was something, of a speech given to a nation. And it's memorized, right? When I was in public school, we memorized it four score and seven years ago or something like that. I don't remember now. It's been a while. But it's a speech everyone memorizes. So something like you would imagine is exact word for word. And it was delivered before an audience. And it was published in newspapers. But when you look at the historical archive, there is seven versions or, or a couple, number of versions. The wording is sometimes off. What's going on there? What's going on there? This is natural. This is part of human speech, human language, human writing, that there's always multiple ways of saying things. And I was telling my, my wife, we were having a discussion, of telling her like, so a good example would be if I teach, I just taught you this class, right? This is the second time teaching Bukhari. Um, I still have the record, I might have the recordings of the previous class three years ago before the pandemic. If I prepare, you have class, like the same topic to now, and you do a transcript, the wordings are going to be different. If I teach the same, or if you give a lecture, let's make it even easier. You give a lecture on a topic you prepared, a khutbah, right? You give a khutbah in Fords, and you give the same khutbah, the second khutbah in, in, in MCMC, and then you do the third khutbah in the same day. I've done that once, by the way. I gave the same khutbah three times, in three different massages. But if you compare what you said, the wordings are going to be off. It's the same meaning. Meaning is the same, the same message you're giving. But if you compare word for word, it naturally it's going to come out slightly different. And you might substitute a better word here or a different word. So that's natural, there's no way around that. And that's part of hadith, that's part of human literature, that's part of Shakespeare's writing, it's part of every writing. So that shouldn't really you know, bother us too much. It shouldn't be to the level it creates a lot of ambiguity. 
But thankfully, in Hadith, they took a lot of measures to reduce that ambiguity. But at the end of the day, there is going to be some flexibility in, in speech. But the best, the, the, the thing that will settle all of this is the Quran. The Quran is supposed to be word for word. But even the Quran, Allah created this multiplex way of reciting it where there's more than one way in some of the verses. So even something that is revelation, that is the kalam of Allah, Allah allowed for the wording to change, not based on our the way we want to change, but you know it was, it was allowed at that time. But that's a great lesson that there's nothing going to be exact word for word. Um, if the Quran isn't, um, then why would the Hadith be? Right? But where still you should be certain and confident that the message is intact. And when you take the best narrations, Bukhari Muslim, the best ones, then you could be fairly certain that the message is intact, what the Prophet taught us is intact. And so what? If Fa is changed to Wow or Iman comes before it's uh, not a big deal. It's still three things. Right? Allah, um, Yes. Form of revelation, then how can we say that it's not, they're not a sacred text, but rather they're merely historical? Yeah, that's a good question. So, what we mean is when you say hadith, the like, well, this is Bukhari, but if I pick up like Ibn Majah, pretend this was Ibn Majah, it's a book of hadith. So this is not sacred text because maybe half of the hadith there are not sound. So that's the problem. Hadith, because hadith has fabrications, because hadith has many hadith that are not hadith, but people think they're hadith. And even the authors thought they were hadith. Because there's so much in the hadith literature that is not hadith, you cannot say in general that hadith is sacred text. And hadith is a historical report that has to be corroborated. But once you corroborate a hadith report and you know that the prophet said it, then it becomes revelation. Then, then of course, you can say, um, I would still say it's not a sacred text because the prophet wasn't intending that text to be sacred. Sacred text means these words have barakah. These words, alif la, mean every harf you're getting reward. That's what it means to have sacred text. For hadith, the message is sacred. The sunnah is sacred in that sense because it's guidance. But the words themselves are not sacred, like the Quran says. That's, that's what we mean by that statement. Okay, sorry, Bob. No, because if they fulfill the five conditions, they would be here. That's the whole point of this exercise. Those that fill the five conditions would have been here. But those that don't, but they fulfill many of them enough to be deemed acceptable, then he narrated them in the other books. But there are hadith in his other books that are also here too. So we're not talking about all of them, but generally if a hadith is in other books, but not in the Sahih, it's still fairly acceptable, but it's a, it doesn't fulfill those five. It fulfills maybe the five to a lesser extent. So maybe the accuracy is there, but not 100%. It's something that, you know, it's fairly acceptable accuracy. So the five aren't just check marks. You got it or you don't. Accuracy is a whole different level. You know, the people, different memories, uh, mor morality also, Adam, is whole different levels, right? Someone who's really pious and uh, wadi of Allah versus someone who's not a decent Muslim who prayed. So they're both Adam, but it's not the same. So that's the whole point. There is some subjectivity there, but. So the five conditions could be not fulfilled fully. Uh, maybe one of them is missing, or it could be that, you know, it's not the strongest accuracy or the strongest adam. And even in the Sahih, I didn't get to there yet. In the Sahih, there's a primary corpus and a secondary corpus. So I'm not gonna, I'll talk about that later. But there are hadith in the Sahih, uh, Jami al Sahih, that Bukhari used as like footnotes, as like secondary material. They don't fulfill the five conditions. So you put some of them in the chapter headings or sometimes as a supporting hadith. So, so there is a secondary corpus within this work as well. That is, that has a supporting nature, not a primary one. When we mean so the, the reports are five conditions there, a sahra sahih, we mean the primary corpus hadith. 
the Asr of the Kitab. In Arabic, it's called Asr. The Asr of the Kitab, primary corpus. So there's Mu'allaqat, there's chapter headings, and others. Sometimes the hadith there is a, for the famous hadith about the music, or at least for this one is, keep talking about that again and again. But that is not in the primary corpus. So someone who says the hadith of Bukhari says, I will come and people consider you know, fornication and silk and musical instruments to be halal is in Bukhari. Actually, it's not. It is in Bukhari technically, so it's within the covers, but it's not in the primary corpus. It's quoted in the chapter heading as a footnote, as a side note, rather. So that is not on the condition of the Bukhari and Muslim. So you have to have like a sense of what the book is and what it contains. No one wants to go home today. Okay, alhamdulillah, we concluded the first week. Uh, we'll go downstairs to make salah and we'll resume next week, inshallah. Wa ta'ala wa alaykum jameel wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.